Hi folks. I'm so sad I couldn't be there with you in Dublin for Open Source Summit Europe 2022, uh, but I do hope I can see as many of you as possible uh, at a future conference, or you can always find me on Twitter. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about why we need codes of conduct and also why they're not enough. My name is Ava Black. My pronouns are they and them. I work at Microsoft in the office of the CTO, but I also work in a couple other communities and different roles. Now, I'm going to give you all a few examples throughout this talk. I'll start with this one. The code of conduct is written so vaguely that you could claim anything as a violation. This was a direct quote from someone who was involved in a reported incident in one of the many communities I work with, and I'm not going to say which one. But this wasn't just anyone saying it. This was actually an elected community leader. Does that surprise you? That someone who was elected to represent an open source community so strongly opposes codes of conduct? What surprises me, honestly, is I've only heard it once. Now that I have your attention even more, hello. Uh, like I said, I work in Azure. Uh, I also do a bunch of work in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, I am also active in the OpenSSF, where I'm on the Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm currently a, uh, on the board of directors of the Open Source Initiative as well. And I've done work in several other open source foundations and projects, and most notably, uh, I served for a while on the board of directors for the Consent Academy, which informed a lot of the content in this talk and my work around consent. And I've worked at a couple companies and a couple startups. That's not really interesting, though. So in addition to technical work, where I've started some projects and written some code, I was also elected to the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee back in 2019. Um, if you read the abstract for this talk, that might be the, the piece of my background you, you latched onto. Uh, my work with the Consent Academy, however, preceded that by several years. And through that work, now this is a 501c3 nonprofit based in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Portland area. Um, a lot of the, the hmm, what that foundation does is primarily try to teach and advocate for consent-based practices in different types of communities. They've been branching out to do more work uh, in, in the tech industry. And so a couple of years back, uh, I helped bring that group and their expertise uh, in to train the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee. And so to start this, I want to share two of the key concepts from, from that group. That consent is a voluntary agreement made without coercion between persons who have decision-making capacity, knowledge, understanding, and autonomy. And each of these are critical components, these four components. Autonomy, this is the principle. Does someone have sufficient power, privilege, or agency to express their free will, to give consent? Right? If my boss is telling me to do something, there's an implicit power difference there. If I don't do it, they might fire me. So we can talk about the power difference there. Or if someone is significantly more privileged, uh, and that can vary by context, what exactly that privilege means, that can also affect our ability, uh, our, our autonomy in that situation. Now, capacity, the second pillar here, does someone have the mental, emotional, financial, or legal capacity to give consent? Can they actually do the thing that they're being asked to do? Information, do they have enough information to really understand what they're consenting to? Are there language barriers or cultural differences that just make the words mean something a little bit different uh, between the speaker and the listener? So these are, are really important uh, to consider. And lastly, agreements and boundaries. And these are uh, ideally explicitly negotiated, though sometimes they might be implicit, and that's okay too. But were conditions drawn around uh, any negotiation or express request? Was coercion used to compromise, uh, to, to, to win a compromise on a stated boundary that might not be as consensual then. So in the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee several years back, we applied that training, 
these four pillars of consent, uh, and a little bit of a trauma-informed approach to how we thought about codes of conduct. And so in, in applying that, we developed a process. The link is on the slide. It's published. Um, and uh, tried to also take into account if there were potential uh, traumatic events around any report we were taking or a situation we were investigating. Uh, yeah. So among the things that, that come out in that process that we developed, it's really important to set clear expectations, such as timelines when uh, you're going to follow up or when a decision might be made. Uh, when taking a report, not to ask leading questions. It's unfortunately easy to tamper with a witness, as it were, uh, to ensure that there is a, it's important to have a, a well-documented process for taking reports and how you protect confidentiality, with whom information, information is shared, under what conditions, what visibility the report will have once received, and to make all of those expectations clear to anyone who chooses to file a report uh, so that they know what they're getting uh, into and how long it might take. Um, and of course, shouldn't have to say this, but if you, are if you are receiving a report, don't share information that was given to you without the explicit consent of the person who is making that report. Um, so I'll dive into a couple additional lessons we learned. Code of conduct are themselves not legal documents. Though when you registered for this event in Dublin, uh, you agreed to abide by a code of conduct. That agreement itself functions as a sort of legal document. It defines the boundaries of the community and who can enforce that boundary. Codes of conduct are not laws. And like laws, they are inert. There needs to be a body of practice behind a code of conduct that can interpret it. I saw this example when I joined a Destiny-themed Discord server once, and I thought, wow, this is so simple. It encapsulates the two most important functions of every code of conduct. It's first to communicate and make explicit your cultural norms. In this case, there's a huge assumption here and shared context, I assume, between folks on that, on that Discord server of what the word jerk means. Um, even if I didn't know when I joined, I could guess from cues and from asking people. And second, this code of conduct makes visible the power structure of the community, right? And every code of conduct should do that, it should define the social boundaries where the community ends where the code of conduct applies and does not apply, and who has the power to enforce those boundaries. A second lesson we learned is that a code of conduct should not center punishment. Many folks over the past decade have criticized codes of conduct for being too vague. This is unfortunately out of necessity. They might include examples of good behavior, but it can't be an exhaustive list. They might include examples of bad behavior, but again, that can never be an exhaustive list. If we tried to enumerate every single good or bad thing you might do, that anyone might do in any community, we'd never have a, a, a complete list. One of my personal uh, challenges in using the Contributor Covenant 2.0 is that it includes a punishment ladder, and that ca can actually be detrimental to enforcement because it can bind the committee and limiting what they can do when responding to an incident, or even compel them to act in certain ways that aren't in the best interest of all parties. Because people are messy and mistakes happen. And when we cause harm, it's important to try and understand the intent and to see what happens after that. When accidents happen, we all deserve a second chance to say sorry, to make amends. However, patterns of bad behavior do need to be identified as they can cause repeated harm to a community and eventually push people out. So if there is repeated harm, it's important to track that. 
And every security engineer knows that when we build a system, it needs to be resilient against those who intend to game the system, to break the system, to skirt the rules and hack in. Trolls, if you will, social trolls, who will test rules for no reason, no other reason than just to buck the system. And in the case of codes of conduct, that can manifest in a number of ways. I am um, unfortunately sad to say that I now know of some high profile lawsuits around codes of conduct in the tech industry. Some are public at this point. I'm not gonna name them and, and draw further attention to them. But when I gave a, a similar talk to this one um, last year, there weren't any public ones. Now there are. Um, and I'm not quite sure how the industry as a whole is going to adapt to that. But moving on, um, the third thing we learned is that code of conduct committees ultimately should support community health. And to do that, to focus on individual safety by fostering as best they can an inclusive and safe environment. So connect patterns of behavior and support individuals, identify people who might need a little bit of extra coaching uh, to help bridge gaps. Uh, one of the, the patterns that I've seen over, over the last 20 years in open source is uh, more often than not projects that do not have a benevolent dictator, there's no single person in charge forever, tend to do better. They tend to become more inclusive as leadership rotates. It's not necessarily true, but the pattern is has held more often than not. But to do that, we also need transparency into how the governance structure of a foundation and of an open source community and project all work. Uh, transparency reports have been a pretty new tool um, past couple of years for code of conduct committees or, or foundations at large to provide more transparency into the health of a community. Ultimately, the without the safety of individuals, the community as a whole is not healthy either. One of my old mentors uh, used to say this, that the culture of any organization is determined by the worst behavior its leaders tolerate. And that leads me to the fourth principle, that a code of conduct committee has to enforce these norms. To take action commensurate with circumstances while while respecting privacy and confidentiality, and to be mindful of increasing community risk through the action they take and balancing that um, to act in private whenever possible and still be seen to have acted in some way so that other people know that the community is being kept safe for them. It's a delicate balance, and I don't have a, a, a magic eight ball giving me any good answers here. Um, so if you've bared with me so far, I want to check in with all of you. Um, and because we're not here together in person, uh, I can't see your reactions. I'm going to pause on the screen for a little while and say I'm going to dive into some uh, difficult examples here. Um, this, if, if that's uncomfortable for you, now's a good chance to leave the room. Um, go to the bathroom, get some water, check in with your friends, look at your phone, plug your ears. Um, if we were at a conference together that had a crisis site, uh, crisis hotline or, or emergency uh, mental health services, I would um, promote those right now and say, hey, if anything that I'm about to say is too triggering, there's some resources for you. I don't know if this event does. Um, and also, in these examples, all identifying details have been removed. Like I said earlier, I do a lot of volunteer work with multiple communities, and I have heard from other people who've shared confidentially and anonymized reports from their communities. So if you think any, any example I'm talking about here applies to you, it probably doesn't. And if you are pretty sure you know who I'm talking about, keep your guesswork to yourself. Do not share that. You're probably wrong, and even if you're not, just keep it to yourself. What I want you to do though, as I go through these examples, is think about how you would respond if you were on a committee and received a report like this. 
And each example, I'm going to sort of step it up from the initial uh, here a little bit, oh, that's interesting, to more and more detail. And watch how your own reaction changes as you learn more information through these sort of mock investigations. The purpose of this in a constrained format like this talk is to demonstrate how complex it can be to receive a report, figure out what to do about it, and then to give you some insight into the kind of liability and safety and accountability um, that, that comes with a volunteer role trying to do this sort of uh, community support work. So deep breath, here we go. Starting nice and simple, a chatbot joins your Slack or your IRC or whatever, and it starts to spam shit. Do you know who has the power to block it? Is that even the policy to block it? Is there an instance owner for your Slack? What if they're not online? Is there somebody else who can step in and block that bot? In Kubernetes, was actually a team of admins, Slack admins, who are all volunteers, who know the guidelines. They've been, you know, they're standardized. And those Slack admins would typically just handle this kind of thing. They don't need to escalate to anybody else, but they do check in or they'll, they'll sort of roll up uh, a summary of how many things they had to block um, to the Code of Conduct Committee. Second example, imagine you just hear a report. I don't even want to say it, it, it it's, yeah. Can you tell what's wrong with this? I guess it's a starting point here, right? Let's unpack this joke a little bit. It's a reference to slipping a roofie, a rohypnol, into someone's drink to drug them. Now, for men, this could lead to robbery. I have heard that reported in some countries, but for women, this is a pretty existential threat. Um, and so this joke could have very different impacts for different people who hear it. And it's also just incredibly culturally insensitive to say something like this about an entire country. Those two things alone make it pretty inappropriate in my opinion. So take a moment to think, should something be done about this? Now let me add a little more color. What if this was said on stage in front of an audience? Does that change what you think should be done? What if the speaker was Japanese or an executive? So you see, context is incredibly important and can really change how we interpret a code of conduct report. And the context is often not obvious at first. So let's just say you overhear this one line. And without context, this is pretty hard to understand. Now imagine that a trans woman is explaining why she doesn't feel safe in a city traveling for work, walking home back to her hotel room after dark. And a much larger cisgendered man says that maybe a few more deaths would be acceptable. Is that merely insensitive? Or does perhaps a lack of intent excuse uh, the insensitivity and the anxiety this might cause? So when receiving a report, it's important to listen to the reporter's interpretation of events and to understand both local context or the broader social context in which this occurs. I hate to cite stats, but in 2020, there were uh, 44 uh, deaths of trans women declared to be targeted hate crimes. So it's kind of an issue. Now, if this were said during an official event of your community, between community members, should something be done? Would taking an immediate action perhaps even expose that woman to uh, an increased risk. So it's difficult to balance. What should you do when? Now let's say you got this report just in an email. 
that one contributor says another contributor uh, suddenly blocked them everywhere that they had been in a relationship with. And so second contributor had to tell their colleagues, like suddenly I, they couldn't work with the first contributor. But then first contributor threatened to sue them for what they said. And now this spat is happening in your community between contributors, and the whole community is kind of torn up about it. What do you do? And this is a sticky one. I don't have any good, good um, suggestions here other than offer support maybe if your community has a budget for therapy. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Lastly, nope, nope, not quite last, second to last, uh, you hear reports that a particular subcommittee in your community is uh, getting labeled as unpleasant, is not very welcoming, um, and there's a history of people joining the meetings or meetups and then leaving after just attending once, once or twice. Thankfully, it's recorded because you record all of your public meetings, right? Um, and so you can review them and you see a pattern. What do you do? What do you do about a pattern? Can you proactively, as a code of conduct enforcement team, uh, can you proactively investigate if nothing is filed when you notice a pattern like this? What do you do? No, oh, that was a, a weird fade. Um, hmm. Yeah, and what do you do if you get reports that a member of the staff of whatever foundation or community, or maybe event staff at a venue, um, oversteps uh, the boundaries of an attendee or a member of your community, and that employee, contractor, or whatever uh, denies intent to cause any harm. They don't think they did wrong. What do you do? How do you balance the needs of a community member and the needs of the people who are paid to support the community and make your events go? Ooh, all super tricky stuff, really heavy. That was a lot of stuff all at once. So let's just take a breath, check in with our bodies. The talk is gonna get a whole lot easier now and a whole lot less emotional from here on out. So we're going to apply what I talked about in the beginning, the lesson the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee uh, learned from applying the Consent Academy's training looking through the lens of these examples and the kind of complex situations that, that can arise in small and large communities, online and offline. Um, and I'll give some tangible things that we can all do. So I hope that you come away from this third section of the talk with things you can now go back to your communities and implement. First, a quick recap. A code of conduct is not a legal document, but there often are legal issues at play. You should not center punishment in the documentation, your code of conduct itself, or process documentation, and you do need to anticipate nuance. Focus on supporting community health and individual safety. Those two go hand in hand. You can't really have one without the other. And lastly, the code of conduct committee needs to be empowered and often seen to act to keep people safe when something really bad does happen. So why is all this important? Because for open source projects, especially large ones and small ones, the community is the value fundamentally. And so if you are a company invested in the success of an open source project, you've built your business on around it in some way, integrated it in your product even, taken a small JS library and uh, you're using it somewhere deep in your dependency stack in your product. Well, a cultural risk in that open source community is a product risk now. And if you're wondering why can't HR take care of this, let me explain a little bit. Companies have long established in-house practices to limit liability, but as the industry has shifted over the past 15 years to do so much more collaboration outside of corporate boundaries in open source communities, we have also externalized our risk. We've distributed the cost of infrastructure engineering throughout these communities. It's fantastic um, 
accelerator for economic growth, for the evolution of science, but the risk has moved. That community is now an external and unmanaged risk. And so we need to adapt our practices because HR cannot manage an external risk. There are no employment contracts. There are no non-disparagement clauses, no NDAs, and very little authority in many cases to block somebody. You can block them maybe in a local area, but you can't block them from the internet. And so if one of HR's jobs is to limit the liability of a company to lawsuits, the corollary here is the Code of Conduct Committee's responsibility is to steward the health of the community without exposing themselves to liability. And we're basically today asking for volunteers who are informed, experienced, and capable of doing sophisticated, emotionally difficult work, who are also naive enough to sign up for that work without protection, that has to change. Because an unmanaged community risk is an unmanaged supply chain risk. And we've probably all heard a lot about software supply chain security. And I'm sorry, but community management is a part of managing our supply chain risks, right? We've externalized our risk outside of companies into open source. The risk didn't evaporate even if we're not accounting for it. It rests on the staff, the foundation, the boards, the maintainers of projects now. If a community fails in public and visible ways or is unable to provide a safe environment for its members to collaborate, what happens to the product that, a that all of our companies have built based on that project? We've all seen examples of maintainers leaving projects when it's too difficult to collaborate or there's a toxic leader who's just being rude to people and making it an unwelcoming space. That's bad for all of us. So we have to consider community health and longevity and community sustainability as part of the risk we manage when we talk about open source software development. This isn't all doom and gloom here. I'm about to get to the actual concrete specific things we can all do. First of all, shift from policing to supporting. I labeled this as priority zero because it's the foundation of everything else I'm going to suggest. For a lot of people, the word code of conduct today carries a negative connotation. But folks, this is the result of underutilizing the support services that are available. It leads to people who think that the, the Code of Conduct Committee's only function is to kick or ban. If we want to change that, if we want to build diverse, vibrant communities, we need a functional support organization who's actually there to support people in their learning and growth emotionally. It's time to raise the bar from simply asking projects to adopt a code of conduct document, to establishing norms of practice across communities. Like I said earlier, the document itself is inert like any law. You need people to interpret it. You need people who know how to who have the emotional skill to walk through an incident response. And so to do this, I suggest we all start establishing a body of practice around the emotional and physical safety creation across communities with a clear expectation about enabling participation in this. I suggest as well that we normalize the publication of transparency reports because nearly everything that a code of conduct committee does is shrouded in privacy to protect the confidentiality of all parties in an incident. And that's important, but a community cannot grow after an incident. It can't heal if there is no awareness of where to grow, of how to grow. As they say, shame in private praise in public. So a transparency report can demonstrate that a community is providing support for its members where and when needed, progress in creating safe spaces for uh, historically marginalized demographics, and to help hold the community itself accountable to stated goals of you know, doing better at, at inclusion, having better events. 
And well, my usual script for the slide would be to say uh, that we've been fairly lucky. Um, as of 2022, I am now aware of three code of conduct committees being sued for uh, actions or community leadership for, for the act of banning someone. Um, I'm also aware of several non-tech communities uh, whose leaders have been sued by members of their own community. And it's, it's really quite a shame. Um, what we're doing today is really asking for volunteers to step up and do this work uh, and not have any legal protection around a legal risk. That has to change. I don't know exactly how. Um, possibly through, you know, directors and officers insurance for people who are on a board of a, of a foundation. Um, that, that has to change if we want to keep doing this kind of work to build inclusive spaces. And we need to fund training in how to handle uh, an incident, how to handle someone who's just been traumatized or someone who has caused a harm and doesn't understand what they did, doesn't feel like they did anything wrong. Uh, we have to train people who we're asking to do that work and how to do it. And so I suggest our, our communities start to formally train COC uh, Code Conduct Committee members or hire mediators or trained uh, crisis response therapists or fund dedicated roles so we don't burn out all our volunteers. The quick recap here is to establish norms of practice across communities, share knowledge, learn from each other, learn from our successes and our failures, publish transparency reports as a baseline so we can track our own improvement publicly that builds trust provide liability coverage where, where important, and to fund training and or staffed roles. And I really want to stress that this is stewardship. In open source, in my opinion, the best leaders are stewards of a community. We don't lead through authority, though we may occasionally wield authority. We don't control. After all, most communities are free to vote us out of a leadership role or simply fork the project. At best, we steward a community of practitioners towards a common goal. And if we're fortunate, no one steps on any social landmines along the way. I want to leave you with one or two closing thoughts. That consent, when applied as a lens both socially and to business interactions, is transformative. And that the ideas in this entire talk are not new. I may have done some synthesis and come up with some good examples, but I learned all of this secondhand from indigenous people, social activists, and other community organizations. Um, some of that can directly be traced to the Occupy movement. Um, and there are a lot of demographics who still have their consent violated in small ways in unmanaged public spaces all the time. And open source communities can be better than the general public square, but only if we hold each other to that bar. If we support new members who are joining these communities, coming from all corners of the world and all ages and all walks of life. And that is part of the wonderful joy of open source is that it is so accessible to everyone and it can also be more accessible. We can make uh, that of knowledge and awareness of our cultural norms more visible to people when they join, so they aren't surprised when they step on a toe. There is, I think, here an opportunity for each one of us to become a better steward of our own communities. Thank you so much. <laughs>